Okay, the chromalveolates. I, I doubt you've ever heard that word before. That, that's okay. Uh, that's right. So who are these guys? They are the alveolates, and also the stromenopiles and a couple of other things. Coccolithophoric algae, for example, have to fight. Um, the alveolates are things you may know of because things like plasmodium and toxoplasma are in this group. These are really simple protozoan uh, parasites. Toxoplasma, people used to think it was a fungus, but it's not. Um, and plasmodium, the big one, of course, is malaria. Uh, it includes the dinoflagellates, includes the ciliates. So things like um, um, paramecium and, and, and borsella, etc. The heterocons are, are, are more diverse than that. Uh, diatoms are heterocons, uh, the golden algae, the brown algae, uh, slime nets. Oh, my seats, the water molds. Um, so there's a lot of really cool organisms in there, most of which aren't really very well studied, to tell you the truth. So here's an example. Many of you have seen this organism in your samples at one point or another. This is a diatom. Um, and common in the North Carolina uh, area is, is this one, Neviculum. Diatoms are really cool. Um, that shell is made of glass, silicon. And it's in two halves. That's where the word diatom comes from. Diatom, two bodies. Uh, the two fit together like a shoebox. There's a lid that's a little bit bigger, and the rest that fits into it. Um, these shells are amazingly delicate in structure. They're very intricate, and, and, and they're, they're common subjects for electron microscopy because they're just so beautiful and complicated. Um, these things move by gliding. Uh, they leave a polysaccharide trail behind them. And that polysaccharide trail ends up on the back of postage stamps and you lick it when you stick the stamp on it. It doesn't taste very good. The old fashioned stamps that you don't peel off. Um, or, and it's that, that mucilage is what it is. It's also on the envelope, on the, on the thing you lick to, to close the flap down. You used to be able, I think you can still get it, you used to be able to get it in bottles as mucilage and kids would boost them together. Uh, obviously, it's completely harmless. Um, sediments that contain lots and lots of diatoms um, are, are, it's, are called, it's called diatomaceous earth. And so you purify this stuff. Uh, because this glass is really hygroscopic, and so it holds water really well. Um, you can purify these shells further, and they're used as a really, really fine abrasive. Um, something like a thousand grain um, of sandpaper is made of this kind of stuff. Polishing uh, telescope mirrors is done with diatoms. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, so, so that's how boric acid works, too, by the way. If you eat if cockroach killer, it's primarily boric acid, and it's just physically uh, grinding the, the, the spiracles of the, the animal to kill it. So it's like. Um, here's another one. This is Phytophthora infestans. There's a big research group here on campus that works on this from museum samples. Uh, Phytophthora infestans causes blight in, in a variety of plants, including potatoes. And so the Irish potato blight was directly caused by this organism. It had a huge impact on history for those of us with some ancestry. It's not really a fungus, obviously. And then there are the alveolates. Ciliates are the ones you know about. This is Vorticella. Sometimes we see these in the Winogransky column. 
the ciliates and some of the flagellates that they're related to um, have really, really intricate cellular structure. You can take a rotifer, which is an animal, and a paramecium, and put them side by side. They're about the same size. And one-to-one -one show analogous structure between their, their anatomy. A mouth, a gut, an anus, a, 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 kid, or a, a bladder. All these things that, that are body parts of animals have direct analogs in a single-celled creature. Um, Borticella, it's a bell-shaped thing. It's got an oral groove here. There are cilia that are around the outside, which they beat to create a little um, vortex that draws particles, bacteria, or food into the, into the oral groove for consumption. It's got a long stalk, and this is full of contractile um, fibers so that when, when they're disturbed, they, 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 that contracts um, with a cubicle thing to pull them away from whatever it is that disturbs them. The life cycle of these creatures is really interesting. Um, they have, of course, nuclei, but they have two nuclei. They have a macronucleus, which is the functional nucleus of the cell. This is the nucleus where all the gene expression takes place. But the DNA in this macronucleus has been cut up into pieces, and the bits they use are amplified, and the bits they don't use are discarded. The micronucleus is the pristine germline nucleus. And so once in a while, two of these organisms will get together, of course, in paramecium too, mate, and that maybe involves touching each other and trading micronuclei. The micronucleus divides, and one transfers back. The two micronuclei fuse, go through essentially meiosis, the macronucleus is thrown away, and a new one is created, one of the micronuclei. It's a way of making a new pristine version of the genome that can then be cut up and managed however it needs to. Because when they do that, every gene has its own telomeres. Telomerase has been studied in paramecium and tetrahymena, which is a relative of paramecium, quite a lot. They have really, really high telomerase. Telomerase, of course, is an important enzyme involved in aging of cancer. Here's one of my least favorite of these organisms, Corinia brevae. Uh, it's now genodium um, red tide. How many of you have seen a red tide before? So um, it's really interesting because th th they're starting to get red tides in Florida. They've got one right now. You don't usually get them in the winter, right? It would be in the summer. But because they feed off of phosphate primarily, it gets washed in, agricultural runoff is causing the problems with that in the winter as well. The, the dinoflagellate generates a, a neurotoxin. This neurotoxin is actually not made by the dinoflagellate, but by the chloroplast inside. Um, it's easy to tell when there's a red tide. Two things happen. Usually the red tide doesn't wash right up onto the beach. You can't see it in the water. Um, but you, know, you have dead fish and stuff floating up, clams that are opened up and dead. Um, and, and all the tourists are walking down the beach coughing. They don't even know what they're doing. But the surf is kicking that toxin up into the air, and they're breathing it in. It's, it's really not very good for you. What's that? It's called brevitoxin. I don't know what the chemical nature of it is. It's a pretty complicated organic molecule, small molecule. Um, dinoflagellates in general produce a wide range of toxins. And again, it's the, it's the symbionts that make the toxin itself. Um, another example of this would be uh, Fisteria pesticida here in North Carolina that causes fish kills on the coast and dries fishermen literally in the sun. 